Okay, I wanted, I always want to get a feel for like who's here. So, show of hands, security is important to me. John and Surya, don't worry, the audience has a pulse. Okay, now, <laughs> uh, here's another question, and this is the one that's going to separate the normal people from the weird kids like me. Managing network policy is fun. <laughs> All right, my people, we're going to hang out. We're going to hang out. Um, uh. Yeah, so we're going we're to talk a little bit about that. Uh, and, uh, you know, some of Massacre's journey on micro segmentation and some of the really cool stuff that John and Surya have worked on uh, to get us there. So we'll go ahead and hop into the next slide, do some quick introductions. Surya? Hey everyone, I'm Surya. I'm an engineer working on the OpenShift networking team at Red Hat. I'm a contributor to the SIG network community upstream, especially in the SIG network policy API working group, which is a sub-project in SIG network. Yeah, hi, I'm John Zace, um, principal engineer at, at MasterCard, and my primary role is the uh, architecture for our on-premise Kubernetes. I've been there 20 plus years and someone once referred to me as a piece of furniture. I've been there so long. Better than dinosaur. <laughs> uh, hey guys, Dana Ruggieri, uh, distinguished engineer at MasterCard, huge open source and FOSS fan. Uh, been doing a lot of interesting stuff at MasterCard in the past five years. Specifically, I've been leading a lot of our micro segmentation initiatives. And these days, I now own the Kubernetes platform as well for our on prem deployment. So I want to spend just a quick minute to talk about MasterCard. Uh, the good news is, for those that don't know, you don't owe us any money. We're not a bank. What we do is we interconnect a lot of different banks and why this matters. Uh, we are a network. Security is very important for our network, right? So if you kind of think about what we do, we're more like your cell phone provider or your internet service provider than we are necessarily your bank. Yes, we do offer a lot of stuff uh, value-added services uh, on top of the network, but at the end of the day, we're really a network. And that's what we're here to talk a little bit about is our micro-segmentation journey. So we're not gonna cover how to micro-segment your network like MasterCard completely, because guys, there is a lot of stuff out there. We have to be concerned with segmenting and separating workloads like bare metal nodes, mainframes, virtual machines, and, eh, couple tens of thousands of containers, right? But we are here to talk a little bit about some of the new advancements that are happening in the, uh, uh, the, the CNI specification that will allow us to more efficiently manage policy. So if you want to talk about like all the details, how the heck do you guys manage policy and all of that? Uh, and I don't remember the exact spec. I had our uh, international band of crank turners run the numbers the other day. We have more than 300,000 discrete network pinholes that we are actively managing just in the data center network. That's, you know, 50 something locations. It has nothing to do with the card swipe network. There are a whole lot more. So there's a lot of scale there, a lot of policy that needs to be managed. And the admin network policies that we'll be talking about here make the job just a little bit easier. So I'll let John kind of take it away from there and talk about some of the details. Yeah. So. Uh Microsegmentation in MasterCard. So as being part of the, the platform team, one of uh, our responsibilities is to ensure that in our multi-tenant clusters, we isolate the tenant workloads. So um, at MasterCard, we have a declarative vision for deploying containerized workloads to Kubernetes clusters. Uh, the idea is to simplify the uh, developer experience. So imagine, if you will, an application team building a microservice for MasterCard can simply declare, here's my code, here are the resources I need, and the connections required uh, to deploy it. And it turns it over to the machine, which creates uh, the Kubernetes constructs to deploy this application, turning the infrastructure essentially into a black box where these developers don't have to be aware of what it's like uh, to deploy to Kubernetes. So how do we take those declarative requests and turn them into Kubernetes resources? So the microservice, each microservice is built as a distinct, what we call a deployable asset, DA, um, <clears throat> that's created in its own namespace as a single pod. When we talk about 
the, um, <clears throat> the tenant applications, which we call a technical asset, a, a, a TA, these are comprised of multiple deployable assets that combine to uh, make up the application, which we refer to as the tenant. And on average, we're seeing you know, maybe about five uh, microservices per technical asset to set the stage. That means we will have uh, five namespaces. So why microsegment? Right? So in our multi-tenant cluster, we could have hundreds of such tenants in there uh, co-located within the same cluster. And MasterCard's default policy is if it can be microsegmented, it should be microsegmented. But if it's in the application data plane, it must be microsegmented. And what this does is ensures that we can isolate any potential breach to the application flow and its authorized connections, uh, limiting uh, the blast radius. Uh, additionally, as being part of the financial uh, industry, we have to adhere to PCI DSS standards. Um, and in, specifically in, in version four, they've added the requirement to microseg microsegment um, containerized workloads. So how do we wire this up? So imagine we have a, uh, a tenant foo and a tenant bar. Um, <clears throat> so it's the platform's responsibility to ensure that those uh, two applications, as seen by uh, the red line there, that there is no communication between them. But at the same time, as indicated by the green lines we have on there, all the microservices for a given tenant are supposed to seamlessly be able to communicate. You know, additionally, there's going to be services external to the cluster uh, that these uh, tenants must uh, connect to, for example, ob object storage or some logging service. Additionally, the platform team has the responsibility for some common uh, services that all tenants need to have access to. So if we go to a, a deny all by default, then what we have to have is common connections enabled and that's the responsibility of the platform team. So imagine in our, our multi-tenant cluster we have you know, 100 tenants in there, and if we go with the, the aggregate of maybe five per, we're talking about 500 namespaces where we'd have to create policy, you know, for example, simply to enable it to be able to talk to the internal DNS. So when we get these provisioning requests, when someone declares, I'm ready to deploy this microservice, what does this workflow look like? Um, it comes in something we call the single manifest. And when that is handed over, the, the platform provisioner is responsible for creating the namespace where the code's going to go, um, creating a quota to assign the resource, the compute resources that are needed to run the application. And then the SDN provisioner is responsible for taking those connection uh, requirements and turning them into some Kubernetes construct for um, micro segmentation. That's just the first provisioning request. The next one comes in, very similar, different requirements, but the same workflow. So this is our provision de build deploy workflow uh, to get your, your tenant deployed. So why not simply use net network policies? Well, we have multiple actors in this flow. You know, the platform team has the infrastructure responsibility. The SCN team is responsible for implementing the workload security. We have application teams that are defining their connectivity requirements. The SDN team needs to be proactive to be able to be ahead of having policy in place before we actually wanted to uh, deploy our workloads. And additionally, if you remember back to the, the example I gave of 100 tenants, we don't want to duplicate network policy in every namespace, which means that's 500 objects, 500 network policies to manage. And what we need is some simple higher level uh, policy that can take care of these needs uh, <clears throat> in, in prepare, preparation for the deployments. Additionally, for the services, it's dynamic in nature. You know, uh, deployable assets come in with a single manifest. This is going to be uh, <clears throat> coming at scale. Tenants may have multiple uh, deployables and add additional microservices. And as you see, when we talked about the two provisioning requests, it seems a little simple and straightforward, but you know, quickly it gets really complicated. And uh, what we need is some sort of simpler approach to being able to securely microsegment everything. So this is where we come in, the open source upstream community, and I'm part of the SIG Network Policy API sub-project in SIG Network. We have been working on the Admin Network Policy API for quite a few years, 
We are an out of tree API. We do not live in core like the network policy API. And when you say admin network policy, it consists of two CRDs. One is the ANP, the admin network policy itself, and then the baseline admin network policy. The differences here is that the ANP is non-overridable and it's specifically designed for cluster admins. The baseline is also for cluster admins, but it is overridable by the network policies. I'll get to that in a moment. But just to talk a little bit about the community, we are a small, healthy community that participates in designing and maintaining features around these APIs. So if you have new feature requests, use cases, please come talk to me or Dan or anyone else in, in the sub-project. We're happy to take use cases here. We, the APIs are in alpha currently. We're on our journey to get to beta. So talking about API semantics and diving a little bit deeper into what ANP is and how different it is from network policies. So like I mentioned, all these CRDs can coexist on your cluster. So you can have your admin network policy CRD where you, this, with the, these rules are evaluated the first. Your, the persona use case here is for a cluster admin to be able to you know, define policies that span across the cluster. If you don't find any matching ANPs, then you fall down to the network policies, then you match there, right? Like, so network policies were traditionally de designed for application developers, for the tenant owners, to be able to create namespace scope rules to pr protect their applications, you know, the the, which are part of their namespaces. So the, the next thing that gets evaluated is that under a network policy. And if there are no network policies in your cluster, the admin still has a way to define a guardrail across the cluster that is the baseline ANP. And this is a singleton object, and it's used to be able to catch. It's like a catch-all, right? So if your tenants or, or your end users or the application developers have not created policies in their namespaces, if there's nothing matching it, you still have that default deny that can kick in. And for the problems that John was talking about, right, like they don't intend to use network policies in their first iteration, but they definitely plan to use it in the future for finer grained control over their applications and microservices that they deploy. But coming to our wonderful CRD API, APIs are hard to design, but I think we've done a pretty good job here, but we're still in alpha, so we're still asking for feedback so that we can graduate ourselves to beta. So this is a very explicit API here, very different from network policies. So how many of you use network policies? Right, so you might find the ANP very, very different. So it's good, it's good to kind of notice the, the API structure we have here. We have a priority field which we defined, and this is because the CRD is cluster scoped. So if you as an admin are creating rules, you want to be able to tell which one, is, which, ha which one has more precedence than the other. And here, zero means the highest, and thousand is the lowest. Subject is the, the part of the spec where you mention which namespaces or which pods you want to apply your admin network policy on. So, so far, it's straightforward. And then you can have up to 100 ingress rules and 100 egress rules in the same policy object. And when you have 100 rules, right, you might again want to have a precedence. So this, this ordering of rules within the object is important. The first rule that you have, the rule zero that I'm showing here, takes the highest precedence. And this one has an explicit action, allow. This is very different from network policies because in network policies, you just define the policy and everything goes boom, default deny, and then you have allow rules in it. Here, you have to ask what you want. And you can have three types of actions, allow, deny, and pass. The allow and the deny are self-explanatory. The pass is a neat feature, a very cool feature, which is what lets you delegate to your network policies, right? Which, which is what I showed in the previous slide. So we'll look at that in a moment also. So in this case, what we're saying is we are defining some peers. This is my monitoring namespace that I'm matching. And I'm saying all ingress traffic from my monitoring namespace towards my subject, that is all my tenant workloads, should be allowed. So it's an L3 match condition. We also allow for L4 match conditions. You can have port numbers or named ports or port ranges. Using any of these, you'll be able to select traffic. And in this case, I'm specifically showing some examples to, to highlight that. So the second rule I have here is a, is a pass rule, and the third rule is a deny rule. So they have precedence, right? So the allows the first, the passes the second, and the, the denies the third here, because that's how you're ordering them in your ingress pipeline, ingress rules. And in case of pass, 
It's saying that all traffic coming from your secure tenants towards any other workload, you don't want to take the decision as an admin, but you're actually taking the decision of letting the network policies kick in. So it's still a decision. It's just you're delegating the job to your namespace slash tenant owners. Same thing for egress. You can have up to 100 egress rules in the same object. And we have an experimental side channel where we start adding new fields. And egress has two new peers which are not present in ingress. They are the nodes and the networks. And nodes lets you do these cool things like being able to express you want to allow all traffic to your Kib API server. You can use a node selector so that when your node IP changes, you're scaling down, having maintenance, you don't have to change your policy, right? Because it automatically selects the nodes. The side ranges are important because you want to be able to talk to things outside your cluster. So egress, like John was mentioning, to Splunk, S3 buckets, you want to be able to tell which, what all outside the cluster should be accessible to by the pods. So in all in all, the nodes and networks are still experimental. We're trying to get it into standard. We're waiting for more implementations and feedback. But if you have use cases to have them in the ingress, do let us know. And we have an, en an enhancement proposal open to let us do that. And coming to baseline admin network policy, the API format is pretty much exactly the same, except it's a singleton. Because there's only one BANP in your cluster, you do not need a priority field, obviously. And this is usually used as something that you can tell, deny everything to anything, right? So, and it also does not have a pass action, because you don't have anything to fall underneath to. So it's just allow or deny in case of BANP. So tying all this back to MasterCard's use case here, where they were trying to micro-segment their cluster, and they're trying to have their microservices be secure by default. They have multiple teams here, the SDN team, which is in charge of policies, the platform team, which is in charge of the security for the platform. So if you create an ANP and just say, I want all my namespaces to be, al be allowed to talk to ingress, to DNS, get traffic from monitoring, it just applies throughout, right? Then the next time the provisioning request comes in, the next namespace you create, you don't have to repeat this over. So nobody's stepping on each other. And because of the whole priority fields, the teams know and can split amongst themselves what priority ranges they're going to use. The SDN team can use X to Z range, and the, the infrastructure team can use the other range, right? Like A to B range, which they are not overlapping. So there's also the nice use case where you can be able to coexist using our network policies. So multiple teams can use them to easily deploy things. So John is going to show a demo um, with all of this on how this works under the hood. So over to you. Thanks, Surya. So we'll get started. And a quick description of what we have here in our environment is that we have 10 tenants uh, created, uh, each with five microservices. And we'll go ahead and get this get this rolling. So what that enables us to, to show is we've got uh, 50 namespaces created. <clears throat> and right now we have no micro segmentation in place. Um, what we'll want to do is focus on two of the tenants, AA and BB. Each have five microservices. They need to be able to seamlessly talk to each other, but not across. So we'll test the first one, right? As we see success, AA can talk to its microservices. We'll see if AA can talk to BB's microservices. Yes, it can, and that's not desirable. We don't have micro-segmentation yet. That's what we're looking for. They are different tenants. <clears throat> so what do we do? So at first, we're going to go and create a baseline uh, admin network policy. As you see, our selector is, or our subject is going to be selected based on that all of our tenant workloads are labeled as tenant workloads, and then we have a default deny for ingress and egress. So now that we've applied that policy, we can see if we've got micro segmentation in place. And as you can see, we've broken the communication from AA to its, its, micro, its back end microservices uh, <clears throat> as well. So it's not working. We need an admin network policy for this tenant. Um, as you'll see for our, uh, <clears throat> our subject and our selectors, we've got the asset UUID, which is unique per tenant. And that's, what we're gonna, that's the label we're going to use to identify for this admin network policy that anything labeled with that is good to communicate with itself. So we'll go ahead and apply that policy. And now we'll test again. So AA is trying to connect to its internal microservices. Microservices, we're checking to uh, a couple of them, but we're not there yet, right? So what do we need? 
So we need the aforementioned uh, admin network policy, the simple policy that will give us access to the infrastructure needs. Well, in this case, we use the, the same subject as tenant workloads, and now we're granting access to DNS monitoring, but you can put whatever else we, we would need in here that's part of the infrastructure. And now we'll test again. All right, so we have success. Like we have AA is now able to talk to its backend microservices. So once this is uh, finished with its test, we'll go ahead and create uh, the admin network policy for the rest of the tenants. <coughs> Got this scripted uh, behind the scenes so you won't see all the actual applies, but we'll see the results. And one thing you'll notice here is that first policy, the allow infra, remains unchanged. Uh, we're adding nine new tenants, but yet we don't have to touch that admin network policy uh, that allows infra. And as you can see here, we have uh, all of our tenants with an admin network policy, and now we can go back to test our use cases. So let's run a test to see if AA can still talk to BB's back ends, which means they would uh, not be micro-segmented if that worked. And we'll kick off another test, and we will watch it fail. So now we've micro-segmented uh, tenant AA from tenant BB, uh, and we'll go all the way down uh, the list of, of, of that. Uh, but let's make sure that BB can talk to its own microservices. We haven't broken anything else. And finally, you know, we see that, it, that we're successful there as well. So, and we still have our, admin, our, our baseline admin network policy, and uh, we're good to go. We now have a cluster that's micro-segmented. <laughs> so coming to the caveats of the, the API that you probably want to be aware about is so because you don't, like I mentioned, it's not an implicit deny like with, uh, with your network policies. So it's like when, if you're a ad network administrator, you're going to choose if you want to allow and deny. So it's good to be explicit, uh, good to remember to be explicit. That is one major difference between network policies and admin network policies. And it's good to remember that you want you don't have any more implicit denies. And for ingress, the only kind of peers you can have is pods. So it's namespace selector or pod selector. So you when you say a default deny, like I'm showing here, from namespaces, it's an empty selector, which means it selects all pods. That's the worst, that is the best case or slash worst case you can go with, right? When you want to say deny all traffic, it literally means denying everything from your pods in the cluster. You don't have a way to have an implicit deny all like with network policies. You can still probably get traffic from external to the pod if you've connected it directly, right? But we don't usually have use cases in Kubernetes where pods are being talked to directly from external stuff. You usually use services to talk to it. But we are having an ingress NPEP to try to see if we can add more types of peers. But just FYI that you cannot do a default deny all. You can only do a default deny everything from my pods. Another uh, caveat here is with, again, empty selectors. But if you put them in the subject, they're going to select everything in your namespace. And since we don't have a differentiation of system namespaces and tenant namespaces, it's as an end user, you have to take that extra step to label all your tenant namespaces. So don't put empty selector in your subject because <laughs> it will select all your namespaces, including your infra namespaces. So you can pretty much lock yourself up if you're not careful. And then if you do a default deny, it's uh, icky. So that's one thing to look out for. And um, specifying the namespace and uh, namespaces or pods, or actually the pod selectors in ANP are only CNI pods. So the host network pods are not even part of the spec, both in subject and peers. That's also one thing to keep in mind. And like I mentioned, the nodes and networks are only in your egress. It's not in your ingress. But thanks to this, like I said, you don't have to create a hole for your kubelet health probe to work because you simply cannot even deny anything coming from the node. It's always an allow. So that's a side benefit of it that you don't have to open a hole for your probe. Another caveat here is in, in MasterCard's case, they're using explicit allow to, for all microservices within their tenants, right, to be able to talk to each other. And then they have a deny for cross tenants. 
But in future, when they plan to use network policies, they're going to have to flip this to a pass action. Because if you want finer grained controls, if you're explicitly doing an allow, you're not going to be able to hit your network policies. So when you're de designing your admin network policies, it's always good to keep that in mind that you probably don't want an explicit allow or a deny unless you're really sure about it. If you want to delegate it, you need a pass. Creating multiple admin network policies with same priorities is also something to be careful about. If you have overlapping rules, like what I'm showing here, two A and Ps, where you're doing the exact opposite action, you're allowing on one side and denying on the other side, as an implementation, you don't know which one to give precedence to, right? So in this case, we are saying that as an API, we are just saying one of them will be applied. Which one is going to be applied is going to be decided by your implementation or the CNI that's implementing the API. And finally, the baseline is just one singleton object, so use it wisely. Usually, it's probably better to use it as select all your tenant namespaces and then do the deny, right? So it forces, and it, doing this actually forces your end users to be able to create allow network policies on top. So you're making it a little bit harder for them when you put this deny. So it's good to you know have that use case in mind. And yeah, so over to. John, who will be talking about the lessons learned and what's next for, for their micro-segmentation journey. Thank you. So some lessons learned. You know, one thing that was pretty clear to us, micro-segmentation controls require you know, internal collaboration across teams. I mean, we had to get together with the SDN team, the, um, <clears throat> corporate security, uh, the application teams, and, and the whole uh, workflow of getting things deployed. So it was a collaborative effort, not just something owned by the platform. Uh, we do have PCI compliance, but it's more than micro-segmentation. It's about becoming secure by default. You know, our implementation says that anything that is going to be deployed has to be, is secured unless it's explicitly approved and implemented. Um, it took a collaborative design. Uh, we worked with Surya uh, and, and the working group to explain our use cases to make sure that, that, that we were heard and we can have uh, an implementation that, that met our needs. Uh, and also starting simple. I mean, we, as you've seen, we've uh, started with a minimalistic approach. We want to keep it simple, and that, that helps be, uh, us to be more secure. And, and potentially, what's next? We kind of hinted at it with uh, the switch from an explicit allow to a pass that will allow us that when we want to start using the, the blue dotted lines of allowing different um, microservices or tenants uh, to communicate with each other, we can delegate some of that responsibility to the network policy very specific for that uh, that action, where as if it has as a pass and we don't have a network policy uh, Defined, it'll work just the same as an allow, but if we want to delegate it, we have the opportunity to do that. So we don't walk through any one-way doors as we're designing this architecture of how we start simple and then as the requirements come in to get a little more granular. Um, and that's it in questions. And we made it through without using the two letters AI at all in this talk. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, Hello. Um, John Durko from Fiserv. Uh, we're also not a bank, uh, but regulated like a bank, much like you guys are. So I think we, uh, we share some of the same challenges. Uh, we have started looking at the admin network policy API on, on OpenShift because, you know, now that that's available. But we're, we're coming from close to three years now as a Tigera Enterprise user. Um, for uh, OpenShift in Calico Cloud. And we are finding, you know, it looks like there's some tricks there that could be handy, but we're still finding it, um, you know, not giving us the sort of flexibility we had with uh, Tigera network policies. So I'm, I'm curious as to what you might have been using before admin network policies. Were you coming from another product? And, um, you know, how have you thought of that? Uh, and, you know, if you were, what's made you sort of move towards admin network policies sort of very early in its development versus some, you know, some more established uh, vendors in the space? So one of the concerns, so we did, we do have an open source based uh, deployment of, 
of Kubernetes for another use case, and, and Calico was the, the CNI of choice for that, and we did go with Calico Global, global Network Policies, and that seemed to, to work well for us. Uh, but as we transitioned to using OpenShift because we wanted a vendor partner in there is what we discovered when we were uh, spending a lot of time doing low value stuff with trying to handle it all open source, that with OVN being what comes with um, <clears throat> with OpenShift, we wanted to go down that road and have that level of support. So it was more of a you know an architectural and support decision than you know solution A met some needs, solution B did it better, and that's why we wanted to adopt the admin network policy with OVN Kubernetes and not add another CNI onto the platform where we would have to have two vendors to kind of pull that off, and that, that's more of a decision than the actual technical implementations of either or. That, that's fair enough. We're also getting pressure from our management on the, the pricing with Tiger Enterprise. It's, it's one of the reasons that we've started looking at whether we can make it work with admin network policies, but it's a little painful right now. Yeah. yeah I think one thing that I would add is, is you know, with, with just native raw Kubernetes network policies, you have a very delicate dance between the moment that namespace is created, you layer on policy, and then stuff can talk. Uh, when you have a default deny uh, posture, you're dancing across multiple automation systems to facilitate that. Admin network policy really helps with that for common services. And you know, as you can imagine, we have a number of security services that are common across all of our enterprise. So we need to be able to uh, support that there. Uh, and then the fewer objects you're managing also, the better surface area. Thank you. Yeah, but we should talk offline for the pain points they're having, but yeah, for the purpose yeah, I, of this I'd talk, this talk is definitely to not Nadia a Nadia as well at the other um, rep, and we're uh, obviously a big Red Hat customer, so expect to hear more from us. And, and John, I think I'll reach out to you. Um, I think we, we might have some shared colleagues. Cheers. Oh, yeah. Cheers. Hey, um, with this level of network policy complexity, how do you... Um, unit test or check that PR that comes in that changes something, that it doesn't cause unintended consequences, like once it gets more complex? The good news is that's not John's problem. <laughs> I was just going to say that. <laughs> I was just going to go. So go. Like, like a lot, of, a lot of you guys, we have separate actors in the ecosystem. So we have a team that their, their job is to focus on managing network policy. That's what they do across thousands literally thousands of firewalls globally, right? So the, uh, the combination of, you know, a bare metal node talking to a container in this container runtime or a virtual machine talking to, you know, heck, I don't know, some physical appliance sitting somewhere. Uh, there is very robust testing around that. Uh, and then there are different capabilities that we have for a lot of our applications that uh, when they do a deployment, they run smoke tests. We do the same thing with network changes too. Hey, you know, make sure you didn't do yourself some harm with this change. Uh, so we rely a lot on smoke tests as well. Cool. And just a follow up: um, How do you handle um, all of the DNS lookups across all of your plethora of namespaces? Like, are you ending up with like n dot problems where you have so many different combinations of like with the like the way the services are configured? You need to know which tenant and namespace, and you have a lot of them. Kind of. Uh, we, can, we can chat about that yep. offline. We take a little bit of a different approach. A lot of our services, we, we don't expose them just to a cluster. We expose them to the whole region. Uh, so we say, hey, I want to go talk to John in region Foo, and that has a stable DNS name. Uh, so there's a couple of ways you can, you can kind of slice and dice that. The previous talk had a couple of strategies that were worth looking at, too. Oh, we just ran out of time before Ravi stepped up. Last question. Are you guys planning to implement the log capability because that was very handful, handy for us when, like, just allow deny, they had an option for log also, so then we could have exactly seen that packet in the <laughs> D message to understand what is going on. Yeah, by log, are you trying to have a dry run mode of sorts where it's not applied, but you want to see what would be the result? beforehand, before you apply the policy? Is yeah, that what you mean by logging? Yeah, or? when I was developing, I used to say allow and log or deny and log together, right? So that 
uh, at least the CNI, the Calico allowed us to do that. And Calico, I could go and do the demessage and look at, especially during the development time when I'm nailing the policies, this really helped me out, right? So I think so that might help even here. So. Yeah, it's um, definitely reach out to us in the subgroup. We are trying to design some of these add-ons to the API to be able to express finer grained things like mm -hmm. the dry-run mode or logging has been mostly in, uh, on the implementation level. So each CNI does their type of logging, but mm -hmm. definitely talk to us. We have some, we are trying to have an uh, enhancement proposal with use cases for you know, end users to be able to do these things. So okay. we are, it's on our roadmap. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you.